Bob. Welcome back. At the end of the last module, we were talking about counterfactuals and the key challenge of entertaining and perhaps ruling out competing explanations. The stick figures with a change in BMI. Was it due to McDonald's or some metabolic pathway or exercise or any other number of things? This fundamental idea about doing research can be summarized in a framework we call effect identification. Effect identification. And for me, one of the leaders of this way to think about problems is the great economist Charles Mansky, who wrote this great book called Identification Problems in the Social Sciences. This can be a challenging book, but if you have nothing else to do on a Saturday night, it might be fun to read. Well, what is effect identification? The key point I want to make in this module is we can think about effect identification, scientific explanation, and related ideas apart from statistics. The key idea here is that we don't need modern fancy statistical analysis to think about identification or competing explanations. In fact, I'll dare say that the idea of effect identification precedes our work in statistics or data collection or related kinds of empirical work. This again is thought work so critical to our research experience. A couple of definitions. An effect is identifiable if it is theoretically possible to learn the true value when the sample size approaches infinity. Uh, what? Just imagine we had all the data in the world we needed. This rules out any statistical worries we have about p-values or confidence intervals or any of that stuff. We just have all the data. If with all the data we can say, yes, this x caused that y, this intervention on the community reduced disparities, when we have all the data, then we have an identified effect. If we can't make that claim, even with all the data, then we say the effect is not identified. There are competing explanations. Again, it could be metabolism, it could have been some meteor hit, some tidal wave, whatever number of crazy things can happen in the world. Identification means we are thinking about and ruling out competing explanations. If when we do our work, we find out that this intervention seems to improve health disparities, and then we bring it to Washington to make the case. And someone else says, oh, but you forgot about this other thing. You forgot that it was an election cycle, or this other thing happened in the state, or that policy change, or there was this or that happening at the football stadium. And we say, well, we didn't consider that. Then they might have an argument against our argument. If, however, we have all of our ducks in a row, if you will, and we have ruled out these competing explanations and say, no, this intervention, we can repeatedly say, has that beneficial effect, then we have an identified effect and our legs, if you will, are much stronger to make change. The key idea, as I said earlier, with effect identification, it is assuming infinite sample size. So for all you statistical people, we can eliminate all that. The p-value literally goes to zero if that's what you're worried about. And therefore, statistical significance, which we'll talk about in a later module, plays no role in this approach. So apart from statistical imprecision, sampling variability, if you care, when we have more than one explanation for our outcome, then we say we have an unidentified effect. So we can't say that some x1 caused y if there's also explanation x2, x3, or whatever else. So the idea that we want to do is when we're designing our research from the very beginning is to think about designing the research in order to rule out competing explanations from the get-go. Those well-designed studies will have a much easier time come analysis, be it quantitative or qualitative, 
be it photograph or some very rigorous statistical survey, all that will be stronger if we think about it from the beginning. Effect identification is very similar to a way physicians, doctors, are taught to do differential diagnosis. A physician in training will learn that, you know, here are the possible diagnoses for these symptoms and will go about learning how to eliminate potential diseases given the symptoms that are there and that are not there and ultimately hopefully end up on a correct diagnosis. Same kind of thing here. Okay, we want to improve community health. We want to mitigate disparities, help the kids and the disadvantaged and all the things we're working on together. What changes it and what might undermine that conclusion? All this is always going to be about, as I said before, quality data and plausible assumptions. Assumptions and data always come together. So when we can do good effect identification, we have plausible assumptions, no competing explanations, and hopefully quality data. Sometimes it's qualitative interviews that are so insightful. Sometimes, of course, very rigorous, statistically minded surveys. Doesn't matter. Is it quality data? We put our assumptions and our data together and make conclusions. This is true whether we're doing a photo voice project or some double blind crossover randomized clinical trial. Always assumptions and data. The question is, what assumptions do we need to make the conclusion strong enough? You might hear sometimes that, oh, I've done a cross-sectional study, which is a study that's sort of one point in time. I do a survey of college students here at Minnesota and ask them some questions. Then I do some maybe analysis and I say, okay, the students are saying that X causes Y, that, you know, maybe um, going to the Gophers football games causes depression or something like that. It very well might. Others might say, no, that's a cross-sectional study that you don't have a temporal ordering. You don't have data over time. Therefore, you can't draw causal conclusions. Some of you might have heard you can't draw causal conclusions from a cross-sectional study. My answer to that is baloney sandwich. Of course you can draw causal conclusions from a cross-sectional study. What you need are heroic assumptions. So in fact, I can draw causal conclusions without any data. I can just make up stuff and call them facts. Some of our politicians might be doing this today. The issue there is that we have heroic assumptions that probably aren't plausible. So we have too many assumptions that aren't plausible and not enough data. So data and assumptions always come together. The challenge for us is a very human thing, which goes by many names for the purposes here. I'll say it's confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is what humans love to do and typically do unconsciously. That is, we look for data to confirm what we already know to be true. So I'm sure there's a Bigfoot out in Oregon, or maybe it's in northern Minnesota woods. And so anything I find in the woods will confirm my hypothesis of this Bigfoot creature. I am prone to not look for evidence that rules out the existence of Bigfoot. This is a mental human cognition thing that happens most of us all the time. Scientific training in this little mini course, or of course all the stuff you guys have learned throughout time, is a way to train this bias out of our work. So we have to be quite cognizant of what we're doing when we're designing and analyzing studies, big or small, simple or sophisticated, because confirmation bias is often subconscious. We're doing it subconsciously and that can bias results without even recognizing it. This idea is not new. The great, one of the founding fathers of modern science, Francis Bacon, talked about this in the early 1600s. He writes, the human understanding what it has once adopted an opinion draws all things else to support and agree with it. And though there may be greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, 
yet these it neither neglects or despises, or else by some distinction sets aside or rejects. So in the early 1600s, Francis Bacon is talking about confirmation bias in science. Here's a, another great quote from the uh, uh, great scientist McCoon. The latter half of this 20th century has seen an erosion, maybe we'll make it 21st century now, has seen an erosion in the perceived legitimacy of science as an impartial means of finding truth. Many research topics on the subject of highly politicized disputes, health disparities, the objective objectivity of so much science has been called into question. The point I want to make is if we don't do as rigorous, clean, strong, supported science and understand our assumptions, we can end up adding to the undermining of the public's trust in our enterprise. And so that's why in the IRL program, we're focused so much on trying to do the best science possible. It doesn't have to be fancy, it's just got to be quality. One more. Good science is more than a mere mechanics of research and experimentation. Good science requires that the scientists look inward to contemplate the origin of their thoughts. The failures of science do not begin with flawed evidence or fumbled statistics. They begin with personal self-deception and an unjustified sense of knowing. Again, passionately dispassionate about the objective of our work. We want to solve health disparities. We want to improve health. The only way to really get there is with good research. There's all kinds of stuff in history. Trofim Lysenko, a Russian scientist, made up all kinds of facts and data, principally about agriculture. And he did not want real facts or science to get involved in what he had to believe for political reasons. And so he, in some sense, has become a joke of modern science. Lysenko science is viewed as something that we want to try to avoid. It was all politically charged with no real facts. This is the danger, the undermining of the public's trust we must avoid. One of my favorite quotes. This is about doing research with statistics, and this comes from Paul Kennedy, the econometrician, playing on the Alice in Wonderland story. How can you possibly award prizes when everyone missed the target, said Alice. Well, said the queen, some missed by more than others, and we have a fine normal distribution of misses so we can forget about the target. This is, of course, making a joke about statistics losing the focus of our research. You and I are keenly interested in action research to address health disparities and population health more generally. We ought not get seduced into fancy statistics when inappropriate. We want to stay focused on the topic.